Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the webinar for our oceans and COVID-19 um, in conjunction with eOcean. So um, just letting you guys know, all the participants, this is going to be run as an open conversation. So feel free to chime in at any time if you want to ask questions. So now we're just going to introduce the team um, that will be speaking about the project today. So uh, Ben is one of our PIs in Western Australia and uh, I'll let him fill you guys in a bit, a bit about himself. Thank you. Um, I'm Ben. I work at the University of Western Australia in Albany. Um, my research interests are basically changes in marine communities over space and time and environmental gradients, also um, any potential human impacts on marine communities. Um, and yeah, I like to play in the ocean in my spare time. So that's how I link towards this um, project. Thanks. You're muted there, Rebecca. Can you unmute her, Ronnie? No. Okay. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Um, my name is Rebecca Bateman, and I'm uh, one of the PIs for Western Australia as well. I'm an independent researcher and I also work as an ecotourism guide on the whale shark boats up in the northwest of Australia. Um, my project Fin Focus uh, looks at shark and ray sightings using citizen science in the northwest in the Ningaloo region. And in my spare time, uh, I love to go snorkeling and diving and surfing and go out boating as well. So yeah, I've got a strong interest in the project um, because Although um, my project looks at wildlife observations, it doesn't um, really factor in so much a broad um, selection of wildlife, and marine wildlife, and it also doesn't really look at human activities. So this project really ties in everything together, which is really interesting to me. Um, all right, and this is the eOceans team, so I'll let them introduce themselves. Hi everyone, I'm Christine Wardpage. I'm the founder of eOceans and the lead scientist, and Ronnie is also on the call. You'll he'll hear from her later. Um, I'm interested, so I've, I'm a marine researcher and I've been studying and crowdsourcing data on the oceans for since the early 2000s. And um, so I'm interested in this project for a number of reasons. One is I've developed an, a mobile app that we're going to use to um, track human activities, the value of the oceans and ocean observations, including wildlife and um, anthropogenic issues using this platform and also leading the um, global Our Ocean and COVID-19 project, which brings together all the different countries and tries to look at a global picture. Next slide, please. So the oceans was founded with the belief that, um, that the ocean can be more exciting and valuable if we make faster and more collaborative discoveries together. So eOceans is the platform to make that happen. And the way that it works is every observation, when you go to the ocean, every observation you make is a small piece of a much bigger puzzle. So the oceans are highly dynamic, variable through space and through time. So when you go to the ocean and you see a clean beach or you see um, a, a busy beach, or you see a turtle or a shark, all those observations together come, we stitch all those observations together to get a more complete local, regional, national, and global picture. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we're just going to go through a little bit of 
local information about um, where we're collecting data, Ben and myself. So we're interested in collecting data from everywhere in Western Australia. So even though I work specifically up in this region and Ben works down in this region down here, we're really interested in, in knowing what's going on all up and down the coastline because what happens down here might be affecting what's happening up here and so forth. So everywhere basically, um, it's all connected. So just to give you a little bit of information about what's been happening locally. So during the actual COVID-19 lockdown up in the Ningaloo Reef region, so that um, when I say during, I mean between the end of March and the beginning of June. So we had almost zero use of the ocean by tourists. It was only a few stragglers that were people that didn't have a home to go home to during lockdown. So they stayed up here. Um, that was very minimal amount of people. Um, some of the beaches um, you can see here were just absolutely deserted. And that's unheard of at that time of the year. April is one of our busiest months. And yeah, there was just no one around. So. Um, but there was a potential increase in recreational use of the ocean by locals. So it's hard to measure that exactly. Well, um, but it was, it kind of appeared that way because we had a lot of people out on boats, not together. We weren't allowed to have more than our household group together out on a boat, but we had a lot of people out on boats, a lot of people spearfishing, a lot of people diving, exploring because they weren't working and they had the time to get out and about and, and, and enjoy the ocean in lots of different ways. And um, there were no tourism boats operating, so everything shut down completely. Um, and there was also reduced industry with regards to oil and gas in the region. Although I believe there was some industry still running, but it was really um, minimal. And at that time, the wildlife appeared as usual. So when I say usual for Ningaloo Reef, I mean extraordinarily usual. <laughs> so we had um, actually one of the, the local pilots for the whale shark industry. She also does research uh, work with her, with her fleet. So she was up surveying for whales and she found some sperm whales not far off the back of the reef. Um, the dugong herds were out and about. There was the sporadic sightings of orcas, which is normal. And the whale sharks were all out there in pretty large numbers, but with, with no tourists to swim with. Um, the only thing, that was all pretty normal, aw awesomely normal. Um, but the only thing that was a little bit potentially not so normal was this um, green sawfish that was spotted um, on, the, on the very sh near shore area to Turquoise Bay, which is normally at that time one of the most packed beaches up here and it was only in a few meters of water right off where the main snorkel drift site is so that that potentially might not have been there if the beach was packed but it's hard to say everything's possible here um, and then after the lockdown lifted and we were able to get out and about and people were able to come and use the area again um, we had a real increase in use of the ocean by tourists and I don't have the exact numbers, but the, the Shire apparently did record thousands more visitors than we normally experience. And it was definitely visible. Um, the boat ramps, the boat ramp areas were packed. The trailer lines were all the way back down the road. Um, all the beaches were packed everywhere. Some car parks and beaches that I've never even seen people at um, were, were full and I couldn't even get a parking there. So a lot of people snorkeling, a lot of people surfing, a lot of people out fishing. Um, and then at the same time as that, most tourism operators were at full capacity and it's only just slowed down recently. Um, so yeah, also the locals continued to use the ocean recreationally. I have a feeling some of them are still not working um, at full capacity, possibly by choice, um, it's hard to say we do have government welfare assistance here in Australia. So uh, I think a lot of people are a bit slow to get back into work, perhaps. It's hard to say, but possibly. Um, and industry recommenced. So 
the oil and gas industries and the mining is all at full capacity again, as far as I'm aware. Um, and this article here, uh, a journalist has written recently just sort of explaining um, the, the slogan of WA tourism, which is wander out yonder, they've called it squander out yonder. And it's basically explaining um, that there's a high level of tourism and not necessarily all the tourists that come here are um, behaving so well, um, but they're just sort of explaining that, um, yeah, there's a whole lot of potential repercussions um, with regards to the environment and the community coming from an increasing visitation since COVID lockdown has been um, lifted. And at this time, the wildlife observations are still fairly typical. So just as amazing as always, turtle nesting and mating season is in full swing. Um, the manta aggregation is back in the Gulf, which is normal for this time. Um, still getting the sporadic sightings of orcas. Uh, the humpback whale migration is just coming to a close, which is normal for this time. Whale sharks have done their recent surge again, which is normal for this time as well, and still getting random amazing sightings like these um, pygmy blue whales. So everything extraordinarily normal. Um, the effects on my project specifically, during the lockdown period, I saw a huge increase in recreational submissions. So which showed to me that it sort of suggested to me that people are now having the time to get out there and enjoy the ocean and having the time to submit their sightings of sharks and rays to me. And this little graph down here just shows recreation. My recreational database was pretty small part of my research before. It, the industry was where I got most of my sightings from, um, but you can see here, it, the project was slowly growing as the years went on, but then once it got to 2020, this whole chunk here is all sightings from 2020. So they make up the majority of my recreational database now. And this was before lockdown. This was during lockdown. So a massive chunk of my sightings um, from the rec database have come from during lockdown period. And that sort of continued um, to be a large um, part of it after lockdown was lifted as well. So that kind of shows that, um, yeah, potentially people are still having quite a lot of recreational time out there in the ocean, a little bit slow to get back into work, but that's just um, one idea. And yeah, my, my computer just filled up with photos of sharks and rays during lockdown, which was awesome um, because I wasn't getting any submissions from the industry um, during that time. Um, and once, the lockdown was lifted and the industry boats as in the whale shark tourism boats started operating again I started getting um, sightings again but not from all the boats as I think they had a little bit going on and um, doing my surveys wasn't really a priority when they were a little bit stressed about financial issues and all that sort of thing so yeah um, so everything's going pretty well here um, depending on who you talk to um, but yeah, due to increased visitation, there are lots of concerns about depleting fish stocks because we've got so many more tourists here um, out spearfishing and bottom fishing. Um, there's also concerns about habitat degradation um, because we're seeing so many people now we're getting just well-trodden tracks in all the sand dunes and the coastal areas where we wouldn't normally. Um, there's possibly a lot of disturbance to wildlife. We're getting a lot of people um, spending time around the turtles where they're um, mating and nesting um, and I guess a lot of the tourists um, are not necessarily educated as to how to interact with that wildlife because they might not have been here before. Um, same with the humpback whales and people are a little bit worried that potentially there might be more press pressure to industrialise um, the region basically to make back money that we lost during COVID, which I think is a common theme around the country that is possibly happening. Um, and yeah, we did have some, um, some community workshops where everyone discussed all these kinds of things. And that's where we found out the main concerns um, that are resulting from COVID and how that might be affecting the, the ocean environments. 
Um, so I'll let Ben talk a little bit about Down South. Right. Um, yeah, we haven't had the same kind of changes as seen up north. Um, but as, as with you know, the whole of Western Australia, throughout lockdown, there were no tourists. I think recreational, local recreational use of the ocean probably increased. Um, people didn't have, didn't have jobs to go to for that period. So um, people spent more time at the beach on the boats. Um, I think the levels of activity have been comparable to pre-COVID-19 down here. Uh, I've been told that Sea Rescue has actually rescued more boats this year than previously, but it's um, probably not a hugely great amount increase, a huge increase. Um, what is suggested though is that possibly come summer, we might experience the kind of increase in um, West Australian tourism that Rebecca's seen up north. So that will be interesting to see how much um, tourism increases through this part of the world uh, over summer when we might, uh, it could increase greatly. Um, if these changes don't happen and, or if the, if the increased, if the increased use doesn't happen, there's always the chance that um, this kind of part of the world could possibly use as some form of a control to see how natural change happened without um, huge changes in human activities over this period of time. And yeah, that's about it for this part. Cool. Thanks, Ben. Um, here's areas throughout the world where um, existing related projects to the eOceans project have been um, in the 20 countries around the world where they've been performed. Uh, this is a kind of what we're hoping to get through the eOceans project, but on a daily, regular basis, um, this kind of uh, information coming through. All right, so we have a little video to give a little bit more information. I'm the volume. Rebecca. Sorry? Sorry. <laughs> I'm not hearing anything from. from oh, really? No. Oh. I think it might be your headphones. Sorry. The ocean economy is valued at $1.5 trillion per year, providing essential products and services to 1 billion people. Many threats, like plastic pollution, ship collisions, and overfishing, have significant costs. On the other hand, there is ample opportunity to celebrate. Billions have been spent on conservation. Species have come back from the brink of extinction. Fisheries have improved. Tourism has value. Protected areas have grown. Although marine researchers work hard to track these changes, a lack of data means their discoveries often lag years behind ocean change. E-oceans can help. Our platform was designed by Dr. Christine Ward-Page, an expert in crowdsourcing ocean data. Our mobile app allows all ocean explorers to become scientists by simply logging what they see. Our analytical tools provide researchers with real-time insights to monitor oceans by species, areas, and issues. Through our community feature, explorers follow how their data are being used to answer complex questions. eOceans is on a mission to help communities and researchers make real-time discoveries to celebrate success, or to mitigate and adapt to change on timescales that keep pace with business, society, and ocean change. Contact eOceans to get a team started in your community today. For the oceans, for us. <laughs> Sorry. That was <Okay>. exciting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, no, thank you so much, Rebecca, and then for your insight on what's happening in your region. Um, it's always so interesting for us to hear, um, at, for, for us to hear the, from the team here in Atlantic Canada, who's so far away from, from what's happening in your area. So uh, yeah, as Rebecca and Ben have explained the project a little bit more, and as you kind of understand now that there is an app that facilitates this project, that this is really our call to action to, to all who are listening today, is we're asking you to download the eOceans app, track your activities, log your observations, uh, share what you are seeing, and then follow the project as it proceeds through your region and globally. So we really want you to think of this app as kind of your um, personal activity tracker or your, or your personal ocean log. And uh, as you are logging what you're seeing and experiencing, um, you are also seamlessly sharing to science. Uh, next slide. So when you first download the app, uh, you, you're, the decision you'll have to make first is what type of observation you're going to log. So uh, you can either take a single observation, which is just a, is a snapshot in the moment um, of, uh, you know, of, of whatever you're doing while you're, either, while you're either on the coast or on the water itself, or you can auto track your experience. So this is really good if you are doing a continual activity, say, walking the beach from the end to the beginning or uh you know doing a beach cleanup or a leisurely boat cruise or, or a research cruise when you use the auto track function you set it and uh, it tracks your time that you were on the water and as you were going through your activity you just create logs as you go of whatever you see or don't see this is a great way to track your effort. So the amount of time you spent on the water and uh, what you logged while you were there. So going from left to right is how you will experience the app on your phone. Uh, first, you are going to need to take a picture. So this is just to set the context. It's to, it's to set the scene of, of what, you're, what you're observing, what you're logging. Uh, you do not need to take a photo of everything you are recording or get close to any animals or people. It's really just for context. As you take your photo, the app will stamp your location with latitude and longitude and your date and your time. This really ensures the real-time aspect of data collection. And then you choose your activity. What are you doing as you are looking and observing. Is it surfing, boating, scuba diving? Whatever you record will, whatever you're doing will change what you, re you record. So next you're going to record the, oh, sorry, <laughs> same slide. But yeah. Next uh, on this, you're going to record the wildlife you see. So the animals, the species uh, from our drop down list of 500,000 species uh, you should be able to find what you're looking at. If not, if you do not know what you're seeing, there's also an option for that too. And then how much of that species of that animal are you seeing? That's just with the counts section on the side there. And if you're not seeing any wildlife, that is equally as important and just as a valid log. So if that's the case, you just hit the skip button and it brings you to the next part, which is recording the human observations. And that is just as important for, for this project and, and we believe as for the eOceans platform as a whole is what, how are humans interacting with the ocean in, in the area that you're observing? So this can be, are you seeing you know 10 surfers, a kayaker, another fishing boat, or human generated pollution such as noise or plastic pollution one thing that we're noticing a lot during this time is disposable masks and gloves. So this is where you would record that and also the counts of what you are seeing. But same thing applies to, to the wildlife. If you are just seeing a beautiful, clean and pristine beach with, with nobody around, it's still a valid log to take. All right, and next. So on the final, on the final stage of, of logging your observation, uh, you are going to have a chance to provide even more context by how your logs are interacting with each other. So perhaps you recorded a whale and perhaps you recorded some fishing gear. 
But what was actually happening is that it was a whale entanglement. So the fishing gear was pollution or ghost gear. This in the notes section is where you would alert us to that. So you would use hashtag whale entanglement or uh, you know hashtag uh, uh, turtle entanglement, whatever it be. It's it's to showcase how your logs are are interacting with each other to provide more context. And then you just verify what you're seeing. Make sure make sure you counted correctly and um, that you chose the correct species or, or what have you. And then save. And there you go. You have your your first your first log to the oceans platform. Woohoo. Yeah, woohoo. So after, after that, we hope that you continue to follow what's happening in your region with our community channel. So this is a feature that's coming very soon, but you will be able to see other people's contributions um, in your region and follow along with teams that you choose. So with your mobile application also comes uh, a dashboard that you can access uh, via your browser or, or a web application. So here in your dashboard, you can see all of your previous logs and edit them. Uh, this will also be a space to eventually be able to upload uh, photos that you might have taken with a different device other than your phone, say an underwater camera you could retroactively add those to your logs that you took in the moment. And this is also the place for you to see the global effort of the eOceans project. So on your mobile app, you're, you're most likely just gonna be seeing the regional effort, but here you get to explore and see how, how everybody else in the world is contributing to this. And if you are a scientist or uh, somebody who would like to analyze your own data, your own observations. We'll also be offering an upgrade feature where you can download your own data for your analysis purposes. Next, great. So one very important point to make about uh, the data on the oceans is that your, the data that you collect is your own. Uh, only you and the teams you choose to share it with are, are those who know the specifics, like your GPS location. Uh, this is not an open source platform. Uh, we do this specifically to, to protect species and special places. Um, we, we know you don't want to alert everybody to, to, to what you are seeing and where you are seeing it. Uh, and currently, all data that you're going to be collecting, as I mentioned, will be going to the eOceans Global Project, our ocean and COVID-19. But you will soon see a team for your region. So uh, you'll see a team for Western Australia that you will be able to join. And your data will be filtered to Rebecca and Ben for data interpretation. And uh, we hope that as the platform grows in popularity, more teams join. So more teams who have separate uh, and important research questions of their own, aside from our bigger project, uh, can join and collect data from you as well. And then if you, as an individual, see a team that you really align with, you manually join and your data gets filtered to them as well. Okay, so yeah, some people have questions uh, particularly about whether it works offline and it definitely does work offline. So obviously you need to be online when you download it and you can sync um, when you're online, um, but you can collect data offline. So if you're out in an area where there's no reception, that's completely fine. Um, it will just keep logging and then sync when you get back online. Um, and you don't need to take a photo of everything you see. Just like Ronnie said, take a photo of the area, which gives context on what you're doing and, and what you're logging. Um, and you can use it as little or as much as you, as you want. And you can record hundreds of observations, wildlife or human, um, even, yeah, whatever you want to do. Um, even if you don't see any animals, the human activity is still really important and vice versa, even if you don't see humans that animal observations are still really important or both together. So everyone out there in Western Australia, uh, get involved and spread the word. And if you're interested in becoming an ocean partner, that would be awesome. Um, let us know.
Um, we've already got one ocean partner up here in the Ningaloo Reef region, and that's uh, Live Ningaloo. They're a whale shark operating company, so uh, and also humpback swim operator. So, yeah, if anyone's interested, um, definitely um, jump on the website and have a look and check it out. And if you are on social media, on Facebook or Instagram, Twitter, or if you're a YouTuber, um, please jump online. We've got a Facebook group, Our Ocean in COVID-19, which has lots of updates from all over the world. So that's really interesting if you want to jump on there um, and any of the other social, social media apps or websites. Uh, you can use the hashtag eOceans or OOCV19. Um, we would love that. Thanks. That was great. Um, thank you both. Thank you all. <laughs> um, I had a couple of just like comments after going through all the other, uh, some of the other regions of the world. I found it interesting. Um, one is the, the difference in open. So when here in Nova Scotia, when we closed businesses, everyone fled to the oceans, but there's not enough access to the ocean. It, like mm. the, the number of people was too, the density was too high that they actually had to close the beaches because there's such a small spaces for people to access them. So they had to close those even for quite a long time. So even just the access to beaches is, is different all around the world yeah. in response to human confinement. Um, yeah. That is really interesting. That's what um, where my parents live in Queensland. They they did close the beach for a while, and when they opened it back up, they had all the people from the city coming to the beach and completely violating the social distancing requirements. So then they made a new rule in those beaches where you could only use that beach or park there um, if you lived within like a kilometre or two of the right. beach because it was just out of control. And so they had all sorts of rules and they kept changing as it evolved. Right. And then if yeah. you add in heat waves, it's very hard like to keep, you know, I think it was in the Netherlands um, where, you know, it, it's a heat wave also and you have a small coastline. So you're trying to get out to it. like a lot of people are trying to use the coast just to cool down. So it became a very tricky um, thing. Um, the other thing, I had a question about where the tourists came from, Rebecca. So when you talked about the tourists, are they local tourists? Or are they coming from another part of Australia? All over Western Australia. So Western it was Australia, only, okay. yeah, so the, the, it was mostly people from WA although a lot of people were stuck in WA right. that couldn't get back um, to their home states or they'd sold the kind of, we get a lot of travellers over here that sell their house or rent their house out and just move into like an RV or a camping type setup and then they don't really have anywhere. So a we also had a lot of backpackers um, that have been stuck in Australia and decided to stay in Australia probably because it's not so bad I guess um, but yeah we've had like quite a few people that are international travellers but have been stuck here they're on working holiday visas and things like that so even though it was mostly domestic like state tourists it was also yeah some other other travellers as well so it's not too far-fetched then to think that they will go south to Ben's region. No, yeah. not at no, all. Right, and, right. and realistically, I, I'm very surprised that or what I've heard is that our accommodation in this area is booked out until February, which is insane because nobody stays here over summer normally, like except for the core local crew really. Like, it's really hot. It'll be between 40 and 50 degrees for a good chunk of time. And the flies are crazy. Literally, like, you'll be in your air con. And you can still go to the ocean, and people do and will. But, like, it's not the kind of place where you live or visit in the summer unless you really love the place. 
Right. So it's kind of, yeah, it's surprising for me to hear that people are booking holidays here in Christmas and over summer. It's like, I don't know if they know. I was thinking they probably don't know. (laughs) Yeah, I think they just don't know. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And and because a lot of the people that were getting traveling here, they're not the kind of people who have been interested in coming here before, but now they're like, oh, where can I go? So then they're looking at all the options. And, but they're still Western yeah. Australian, right? Yeah, Like they're yeah. still local. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they're still local, but they've never, you know, we're 13 hours drive from Perth. Right, okay, that, right. So it's a long way. And, and Broome, further up north, that's probably like 20-something hours drive from Perth. So it's not the kind of place people come to um, if they're not super interested in the natural world. Right. or camping because it's desert it's remote there's no Woolworths or Coles supermarkets there's you know it's yeah it's a different kind of place and it's not cheap yeah. it's not cheap to come here and normally they could jump on a $100 one-way flight to Bali right. and then a hundred dollars back on on a sale you know price and which is pretty common so it sounds wonderful to me <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Maybe not the just, heat. No. Yeah, it's just really it's expensive comparatively speaking. Like you can fly from Perth to Thailand or Indonesia or Singapore or Malaysia for so much cheaper. So they they normally go to places like that. To come up here, you're going to spend a lot of money on fuel or a lot on flights because the flights aren't cheap. Accommodation's not cheap. Food isn't cheap. Everything's quite expensive up here. So they don't have an option right now but to go to places like this I suppose and they've been escaping the cold and it's normal for them to escape the cold up here but not in this amount of people like with right. this yeah so uh, in the other places on the eastern east coast of Australia they were talking about a massive increase in citizen science seems similar to yours also I think Alice said like 4,000 oh. percent increase in citizen yeah. science for for numerous reasons, interest in local place, um, more time, but watching the local um, flora and fauna, so an interest in it. So it's interesting to see it happening elsewhere. Yeah, that is interesting. Great. You might not know uh, the answer to this, Rebecca, but you were talking about, you know, whale sharks normally having large tourists to to swim a lot of a lot of tourists to swim with um i'm not sure i'm not sure what provisioning looks like down there but i'm guessing that there's probably no provisioning there wasn't provisioning done during covid 19 or is it just not done at all we never have provisioning okay. here yeah you know you don't need to but um it's more like in the philippines interesting yeah yeah, because I was just thinking, like, no tourists, there's no no need to do that. But if there's nothing, if it wasn't happening, yeah. there'd be no difference. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it would be inter- the good, per- the right person to speak to about, yeah, because that is an interesting point, whether the provisioning is still happening in the places like in the Philippines and Indonesia. Gonzo, um, one mm. of, uh, Gonzo, who works for La Marve in the Philippines, he he would be the one to speak to to see if, the provisioning is still yeah. happening. I'm guessing maybe they are just to keep keep them around. I'm not really sure. Is or it the same too. in Ben? Is it the same there? There's no provisioning in the in the south, is there? Not and what about really. fisheries, Ben? Um, in what sense? Is anything changed with fisheries? Are there are there fisheries still operating as usual, or has there been any? Um, they would have slowed down through the lockdown part, time of things, but we don't have the kind of restrictions they do in the rest right. of the world, so even the rest of, rest of Australia, but they would fairly much be back up and running back to normal. And that's the lobster fishery, mostly. That's the main one here. I mean, like yeah. I said before, there's other smaller ones. They'd all be operating again. Okay, great. Thank you yeah, so much. The prawning, the prawning industry here has still been going, just business as usual. Okay. Yeah. Great. It's so helpful to hear about this. Thank you so it much. It would be really good to get someone in South Australia. Have you got anyone there? 
No. No. I'll, I'll have a chat to some friends and see because it would be super interesting to see what's going on down there, mm. especially, yeah, especially now that things will be possibly starting back up again. But I think it's been pretty quiet down there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That'd be great. Anyone? Get a whole picture can... of Australia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. North too. Mm -hmm. We're missing. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank you both so much uh, for, for your support and for, for leading this webinar today. Um, this project. is, uh, yeah, this, in the project itself, this is a, a recorded, <laughs> recorded session. So it'll be available after. And uh, yeah, we'll probably be thinking about an update somewhere, somewhere mid through the project of, uh, of something similar like this. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Good nice night. Nice to see you again. Good day. <laughs>